All right. Welcome to another episode of the CTO Advisor podcast. And we'll publish at least a portion of this, not all of it, in video. You know what? The Now that I have access to all of Futurum Group, I have this really unique capability now to bring in super interesting guests. This week's guest, Diane Heathcliff. Diane, this is what, your third week at Future Third Group? week at Future Group, yep. And you lead our CIO practice. First, introduce the audience to you, because I don't think you've ever been on the podcast. We've no, known each other for years now, but you've never been on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I've known you, Keith, for a long time, but um, I've, I've done a lot of work in the IT industry. I've been in the industry 30 years. Um, I'm an ex-practitioner, so I've built really big systems, been chief architect uh, for a couple of very large organizations, delivering very, very difficult things. So uh, you know, I, I'm, I know the buy side, the delivery side real well. Uh, but right now, I, uh, I focus really at the CIO level, uh, IT strategy, digital transformation, everything from budgets to innovation, because uh, the, the chief information officer is becoming the chief innovation officer. And so... Uh, that's really what I'm, I'm kind of working with to build the future CIO community. And so great to be on the show, Keith. Thanks. Well, I'm honored to, one, uh, have you on a show. And then two, more, most importantly, when I got with that you might be working uh, with the C- with uh, the future group, the CIO practice within the C- future group, I got really excited. Uh, uh, there's nothing Thanks. but respect. And I think the audience will see that as we do a recap. One of your first events, or rather your first event with the Futurum Group, covering the Futurum Group, was SAP Sapphire. We both, I believe, met each other at Sapphire many moons ago. And the That's message right. the message from Sapphire has been consistent in the, in the aspect of like what where they want to go. The technology has shifted a bit. And of course, AI has kind of thrown a a wrinkle in all of this. I'd love to get your insights from a CIO perspective. And then as a CTO advisor, I would follow that up with kind of what will it take to get there? So what the strategy and what you heard from a strategic perspective, and then what I heard from a technology perspective to meet that, that strategy. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Keith. So, uh, yeah, SAP had a re- very interesting show because the world has changed, as you know, Keith. Uh, AI is on the CIO agenda. Um, the CIO is, is getting a lot of pressure from the board to do something uh, of competitive significance. They know if they don't put AI in the core of their business, the, the competition will, maybe a new digital gazelle will, and just and eat their lunch. And they see that as a threat, and that's a, that's a board level uh, responsibility. And so they're breathing hot and heavy on the CIO, and SAP knows this. And so the message very clearly, it, you know, and it was the Kristen uh, Klein show uh, for sure. Um, uh, it, you know, he came out in the beginning and really immediately jumped into AI. Here's all the use cases. Here is we have we have two things that we're doing. We're putting AI into all of our products, uh, and we're enabling specific use cases. And we built this this intergalactic ecosystem of strategic partners who are going to build best of breed SAP implementations of, of AI use cases. So everything from, you know, maintenance uh, to customer service uh, and presumably marketing. Uh, they said they're, they're really focusing by the end of the year to get 10 really juicy, you know, high value use cases in each um, business domain that they serve as each main business domain. So about a hundred really move the needle use cases. And these are from, you know, big partners from Ex- like Accenture and Deloitte and things like that. They had a, they had a who's who list up on the stage and that was the primary message. Um, and, and, and so one is putting AI throughout their product. And the other one is they've brought a co-pilot that is an expert on ERP and they're building their own model around this. So they were really coy about what's going to be in that model and it's opt in and, so the customers can train it on their data so that it's really relevant to them, but it's an opt-in thing. They don't make you do it. Um, and it talks to Microsoft's co-pilot, so there's still only one co-pilot. So that was the other really big uh, message. It's called Jewel, and so the, like the energy unit, not like the the gem, right? So, uh, but I think that's it's supposed to play, you know, a dual kind of um, a dual plan words, if you will. Uh, and and so there were many more announcements, but that was the lead up. Um, in the very beginning, Christian Klein came out and said, if you're do, you need to do AI, SAP is going to deliver it for you. And that was, they just beat everybody over the head 
uh, for that. And rightfully, I think the audience was expecting that. So, so that, that was that was my impression. We can go into all, a lot of the other announcements. I'd love to hear what what you thought about from a practical standpoint. Um, uh, what's this going to mean for for customers that they, as you have to actually implement this? Yeah. So you know, if you're been around the SAP and ERP space for a while, you know that these large ERP companies, especially SAP, has been pushing their user base to the cloud. I remember managing SAP way back in 2015 to 2017, basically, uh, or 2014 to 2017, practically. And that whole time period, SAP was pressuring us to move our SAP operations to the cloud, but there was very little business value back then. It was understood like why they would want us to move to the cloud uh, from their perspective. But from a customer perspective, I didn't understand that or I didn't buy the reasoning. Today, AI, you know, you, you know this from a CIO perspective. We don't want to do these pr projects on premises if we can avoid them. We got enough challenges from an infrastructure perspective, managing the infrastructure around traditional technologies, cloud technologies. AI is yet another technology to manage. And the push to cloud makes a little bit more sense. The challenge, and every CIO and CTO knows this, this is not a technology problem in itself. It is absolutely a people and process challenge in order to get to the cloud, getting to that clean core, which is what we heard a lot this this, oh, this yeah, Sapphire. Definitely. We've heard it previous Sapphires. Getting to that clean uh, core where we're not using customizations and preventing the move to the cloud, that was the biggest barrier that I heard to getting to that uh, vision. We can talk about the specifics around the advantages and some of the uh, opportunities and challenges around specific features within AI, but AI big, what I walked away thinking, wow, this is the first time the SAP has had a compelling stick and carrot to get people moved from on-premises instances of uh, SAP S4 or, or, uh, 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 or uh, previous versions of SAP to the latest version. And not just the latest version, the latest version in the cloud. Well, and I thought I liked the clean core messaging too. And they were very uh, clear about that, that. That is, if you want to be able to move fast with SAP, you better get a clean core. That's the approach. Uh, and I asked their SAP customers, uh, what they get, made, gave me special access to a few of them. And I asked them about clean core and they're all signed up for it. But, but Keith, here's what I really want to know uh, from you. Um, so, you know, I, I'm an SAP customer. I, 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 let's say I buy in that AI is going to save me a bunch of money in customer service uh, and you know, doing predictive maintenance in my factory. Uh, I, I like these use cases. And now I'm going to be running AI all the time, all day long, operationally. Um, that's going to take a lot of compute power. You know, doing inference requires access to a lot of GPUs. Um, and my research is showing that it doesn't always make sense if you have a lot of very high, always on high intensity, you know, HPC style workloads, HPC meaning high performance computing, um, and you're running AI all day long, uh, does public cloud really make sense? And I know SAP is actually now pushing both sides. They got grow and rise, both, you know, to say, uh, you know, if you want M-Prem, we'll give it to you. And if you want public cloud, we'll give it to you. Uh, you're, you're covered either way. But in practical terms, what does it mean, Keith? How, how are companies going to run these workloads um, and, and do it affordably? Yeah, that's an insightful question. And I think one of the challenges, the challenging questions is, and this is not just across SAP. You know, if we're talking about SAP adjacent and competitors, Salesforce and every SaaS offering that now Absolutely. needs to have a um, some type of uh, AI inferencing capability and being able to get close to your data. You know, all of the big equipment OEMs will tell you this is the opportunity for them to shine, for you to put your equipment in a colo or somewhere close to the cloud so that you can optimize for not just cost, because cost is a legitimate concern, as you mentioned. Capability is a legitimate concern across the, the, the different data sets, but also latency of data. 
Like if your data is sitting in Salesforce, in the Salesforce cloud, if your data is sitting in on-prem and flat files in your uh, NAS, traditional NAS services, in SAP in the cloud, that latency matters. And yes. that uh, ability to get to business intelligence, the value, what Dale would call, we'll bar borrow Dale's term, the AI factory, getting from your data to intelligence, all of this is concerned. So from an enterprise architect head, as I look at the data, where my data resides, where I need to put the AI closest to the data in order to get those results, these challenges come to mind. So RISE becomes kind of the opportunity for a technology perspective to say, hey, how do I put my data close to the, uh, how do I put my AI close to the data and get the value out of it with, with while controlling costs? SAP was light on that messaging on what, how to get AI close to the data sets and RISE and to and what that cost model will look like. So um, I'm I'm anxious to kind of understand that hybrid approach. I I agree. They were not explicit about what the costs were going to be. They were saying some of the right things, like you you know the, uh, I heard you know them saying uh, in, in private sessions that we had that were not NDA uh, that you know if we're not going to use uh, a, a model that costs eight dollars to answer a question, when you can use an AI model that, that, that costs two cents to generate an answer, right? Um, so it was, they're making sense about that, but it isn't clear about how they're going to deliver it to the customer. And so um, I like the AI messaging in, in terms of they are they're showing that they are investing at a at a world class level um, at you know a top tier uh, vendor level. They're investing enough to be able to deliver AI strategically for large swaths of the business. They're not covering everything. You know, and, and I, I, you know, I think they are going to get uh, the customer experience. You know, SAP does have a customer experience product, and, and they talked about marketing and, and some customer care and things like that. But um, you know, when they're talking about finance and they're talking about um, you know factories, you know, that's where SAP has the credibility. And I expect that they are going to deliver the value for their customer. It's clear they're very committed, and they have they've they've oriented the whole company around it. Um, but. That wasn't the only message uh, that, that they had uh, for, uh, by any means, um, you know, and, and you know, they've really been talking about um, as well a lot of strategic collaboration because uh, they can't everything's now built with everything these days and, and we're all building on the shoulders of giants. So they had like the new CEO of AWS up there. That was a big proof point. He came up, up early in that in that keynote. Um, uh, you know, Garmin, um, who said, you know, they really committed how they're they're going to bring the Graviton chips uh, to to bear. So that that that, that special sauce, because Graviton um, is something that, that ADA, AWS is not selling; they're only renting it to the market. You cannot get a Graviton chip, as you well know, Keith. Uh, but then they had they had Meta and they had Mistral up there. Nvidia, they had of course uh, the CEO of Nvidia come in call call in from from Taiwan. Um, and they say the SAP basically runs their supply chain, and they're the you know they basically uh, he was he was saying that they brought almost the entire capabilities that Taiwan Nvidia has to to bear on the AI problem, but all of that's being run by SAP. It, that was compelling, and that got a that got an almost standing ovation uh, just to show how you know not only is, is SAP delivering on AI uh, for their customers, but they're enabling the AI revolution itself, right? So. Uh, all those, I think, came across really, really well, really good. Um, but now the delivery part's coming. And that's, I think, this is, this is these questions that you and I are having about how do they actually do it? You know, uh, how are they going to make this cost effective? Yeah, and this is one of the things that they've, I want to say, stumbled on in the past, the messaging around cloud and partnerships. You know, you could go all the way to back when they partnered with what became a subsidiary of EMC and uh, all the way through the start and stops with the previous cloud providers. I don't get the sense that SAP believes that they can go at this alone anymore. I, you know, before I thought they really wanted to control yeah. cloud, not just from a architectural design perspective, but from a relationship perspective. They knew, they know the value of the relationship. Uh, SAP has had the challenge that once the solution is deployed, 
they lose that relationship with the sponsor, with that initial sponsor, the person that drives the, the strategic value. As a CTO or as an architect, SAP can come to me all day and talk to me about the value of clean core. Okay, yeah, I get it. That's awesome. I, I want to do it. But if I can't get the business to come along with that journey with me, because that requires transformation. This was a conference about transformation. If you know, if if I had to wrap it up in one word, it was transformation. Technology, process, people, all wrapped up in the bubble of AI and getting to AI. And SAP as an organization, what I heard with those partnerships was a transformation, which was we're going to play nicer with AWS. With you know, when was the last time they had a hardware vendor at all on stage at SAP? They they really too. Yeah, never yeah. cared. If you know that that's the thing that that the the solutions provider provides what hardware is going to run on. To have Nvidia on stage was a huge deal. Well, and, and it shows you how important chips are are critical again because the, getting the compute to do AI uh, and doing it cost effectively is is really becoming one of the major challenges. Um, but Keith, I'd be curious to know also uh, from your standpoint. I'm a big proponent of low code, and I think I, I not I don't even just think I now have evidence I collect because I collect it that um, CIOs are now looking at low code as a way of of catching up and doing digital transformation much faster. And SAP actually cited a number. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was saying that most business processes are going to get touched uh, this year to have AI added or otherwise transformed. And we see things like SAP Build, SAP Integration Suite, um, and then they had Jewel showing uh, up there. That's their co-pilot, uh, AI, um, modifying SAP processes in a very low-code fashion. It was it was really impressive uh, and, 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 and uh, even creating new integrations. They had, and they were demonstrating this in keynotes. I couldn't tell if they were live. I mean, they looked real, but um, yeah, you know, this is, this is the holy grail. This is what people need to transform fast. And that was the message we heard over and over again. You're, you're going to touch all of your processes soon because you have to add AI to them and a bunch of other things. You, you need to integrate everything. Jewel is going to help you do it. We're saving two hours per SAP developer per day using Joule now developing going forward. I thought that was an interesting proof point and that pays for, that will pay for, if I do a back of the envelope comp, uh, uh, computation, that will pay for uh, Joule most likely just by itself. Um, but it, the the question I have is how fast now can users really get this, um, can CIOs get this to market? Because I'll tell you the dirty secret, Keith, is uh, clean core is great, but that most of their customers didn't start with that approach. So they still have this big tangled mess. Everyone going forward, new customers are, are sitting pretty because their customizations are compartmentalized. But the reality is I talk to CIOs and they're, they're two, three, four, five versions behind an SAP because they have all their customizations mixed in with the core. And so I don't know, how, it's, it's great to talk about these things that were really important announcements, but my worries still, it will take years for most customers to do this. Yeah, so if you, look at the common problem between CIO, CTOs, resources. Yep. Where are the people that need to take the business logic and convert that into some type of application or technology? Totally. That is the problem. I can go out and hire a hundred developers, but if these developers don't know my business, I am going to create more friction than I do potentially capability. They're just going to sit and there and spend a year or two learning their business before they get anything useful done, right? Yeah, in an ideal world, I have these Excel superstars who are just their line of business users who learned how to use Excel out of a necessity to do their business process, whether it's Excel, Smartsheet, or some adjacent technology that sits around SAP. They built business process on top and around of SAP. So you add customizations to that, and now you have turtles all the way down. You know, I have I've built this process using a third party tool in my department that is based off a of customization within SAP. And now you want to go to a clean core, take away that customization from me 
And now my business process is broke on two levels. One, I might have to change my business process. And then two, this customization that I built within my department now has to change. Where is the resource to help me make that change? This is the promise of Jewel, right? That exactly. Jewel I think that's what they're that, hoping is Jewel's going to be able to dig people out of that hole. That, that you know, and, and we've seen some evidence of this uh, in traditional Python, Rust, Go, and other languages. Folks who are not application developers, they're process experts being able to talk to these code pilots ask for code and code is spit out. They gave a demo of about code being generated via Jewel. And I'm like, whoa, that's, yeah, that's kind exactly. of scary to give a business user access to SAP's core programming language to keep the, to create customizations. But that's the need, right? We, we need process experts who have low friction access to tell the system what they want from a uh, from a business outcome perspective, and then that to be just generated. Well, and I, you bring up a very good point. So, where does those system process experts come from? I believe SAP is hoping that customers are going to opt in, let Jewel get trained up on on their entire code base, um, and then be able to make modifications based on that. I, I mean, I'm virtually certain that's what their their plan is, and they say you you got it, you've got to train. Um, you know, you've got to do the opt-in process so, and then you'll move at light speed because Jewel can just write all, you know, all the change orders, whatever change orders come on down, you can take the, you literally give it the copy and paste the change order into Jewel and it will generate the changes. That's, you know, that's revolutionary. And if, when organizations can get there, if, if Jewel can be used to move people to clean core so they can start, you know, deconflicting that, that, those, those, you know, those problems, because I'll tell you that here's the issue, Keith, is a lot of CIOs are still versions and versions behind. They can't run all this new stuff because they've got everything hardwired together into a giant, you know, giant spaghetti code, um, yeah. you know, spaghetti code base. And so, you know, could you um, imagine as a CIO, could you imagine being, t you know, on, you know, pre HANA? Yes. Matter well, of fact, I run into them all the time. Yes. All the time. Just pre HANA. I'm not talking about, you know, R4 or, or, I mean, uh, yeah, R4 or, or you can be even before that, you can be R3. Some some customers might yeah, even exactly. be There's still a on couple. R3. I know of a couple, yes. And one of their, you know, uh, uh, board level folks went to Sapphire and thinking, wow, I've, SAP had one of their board members kind of advocating for uh, this board level change. And you're a CIO and that board member comes to you and said, all of this that I saw at uh, at Sapphire, that's exactly what I want. Diane, go out and make it happen. That would be a nightmare scenario. Yep. And that's where the uh, where I advise CIOs to 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 try and plant the seed ahead of time, saying you're going to see a bunch of stuff at Sapphire. Uh, we've been asking you for $50 million to get into a modern version of SAP that has the ability to it really help me do and keep me on the, the clean core. Um, you know, uh, so beware that there is a cost of entry. And that's because that that's that's the reality is technical debt is pretty high. And and, and one of the things SAP did is always been good at, but they were very good at this at uh, Sapphire was they had lots of customers up on stage singing the praises of how fast they could implement SAP or how fast they could migrate or whatever. Uh, and that was great, but there was there was really a shortage of clean core examples. I think they had one one customer up there um, expounding it. The problem is is that approach is just it's too new for most CIOs. Are not I would say many CIOs are not yet there to the point where they can get that. So that's the gap that SAP has to close. They're they're writing a lot of checks that people want to cash, uh, but a lot of people just aren't there on a place that in their in their enterprise technical debt bank account to to do it to get you know to act turn all this stuff on. So, Diane, it was great having you on. I, 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 I'd be remiss without saying that I've, I've gone through the clean floor experience moving from multiple instances oh, of AP Global at AtV to consolidate it down to a single instance and a single instance clean floor. Wonderful outcome, but <laughs> the pain of getting there and that $50 million number for AtV, I'm, this is a t shirt size, low. 
So the yeah. for a company the size of Advi, that's you know that's just a a, a low. So it, it varies for company. But that's a middle of the road number. I agree. I yeah, the, that's... without the without the uh, without the number, just the I, I can't I can't understress the amount of work and just attention that this needs from your staff like this is a all hands on deck we're putting almost every other project related to the business on hold as we do this because the ask from a partnership between it and the biz, uh, business line teams is not small it is tremendous ask and that for me is more was was the, the greater learning than the technology journey itself it was absolutely it had to it had, it had to have board level buy-in for it to happen well because of the, because of the dollars uh, and here's the here's the dirty secret keith um the number average number of erp systems that uh, a fortune 500 company has has risen from a, an average of eight per company to 20. Uh, that's the data i collect uh, because they're acquiring companies and they can't integrate them as fast as they acquire them. It takes it takes years to justify that that uh, to you know integrate uh, an acquired company so they're all on one standard ERP. Can you, and so um, I know one sports manufacturer who's acquired all these little companies. He's got thirty three ERP systems. He's never I don't know what he's going to do. And so, remember, this is not this is not a question of platform versus platform. It can be the same platform. SAP yeah. nine clean core SAP. Uh, clean core. You still got to integrate them. It takes work, right? You got to so, integrate them. It, it, it yeah. is. It is an. It is a good challenge, and this why folks like us exist. Diane, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Oh, I am. It was a privilege. I've always wanted to be on, so it was thrilled that you invited me. I thanks so much. Yeah, we're we're going to do a lot more of these of uh, you know CIO CTO uh, lenses, and this is just the first, and I think it's probably the perfect example of the partnership moving forward. Yep, totally agree. Thanks so much, Keith. All right. If you want to know more about the Futurum Group, you can find us on the web, thefuturumgroup.com. Well, We're the Futurum Group on X. Not confusing at all. <laughs> if you want to learn more about me, I'm on X at CTO Advisor. And I still run thectoadvisor.com, which is where you get the more technical content versus the Futurum Group. Diane, uh, you're pretty active on X. Yeah, I am. You can find me at, at D Hinchcliffe, which I am everywhere on all social channels uh, and and elsewhere. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to, uh, to getting this out. And I'd love to spark discussion in the industry about th these topics. This is this is well, it's front and center right now. All right. We spent a little extra time on this episode, but I think it was worth it because this is a heavy topic that a lot of folks are challenged with. Talk to you next CTO Advisor podcast.